chapter 16, we have been following along. The children of Israel have rejected God's offer to go into the promised land. They got to that point of being right there at the border. They sent some spies in. They came back out and said, no way, we're not going in there. There's giants in there. And uh, the people rebelled against God and decided, no, we're not going in there. God can't protect us. We don't trust him enough. And so God has told them, okay, fine. Uh, The children, your children, who you said will be killed in there, will be the ones who enter into the promised land. But you will, you will wander around out here in this desert for the next 40 years, the ones who rebelled against God, and, uh, and that will be your fate. And so uh, we've looked at that in, in a couple of different ways, but now what we find is a group, a large growing group of the congregation say, no, that doesn't sound very good to us, wandering around in the desert for the next 40 years and then dying out here. And so they're wanting some new leadership. And so tonight, we're going to look at the mutiny of Korah, or Korah's rebellion, as you probably have it in your Bible. Uh, I'm a Navy guy, so I like the mutiny idea more. If they were at sea, it'd be a mutiny, so we're going with that. But uh, just a couple of verses here I wanted to look at, and then we'll take a closer look. In verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abim, Abiram, uh, the son of El, Eliab, I love these names, you know I do, and on, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And so we see the the basic idea of this whole chapter here is that Korah has, has gotten a group of people together Many of the congregation, many of the leaders, 250. And we know, of course, that there are many more people than that. There's probably over 2 million people out there at this time of the children of Israel, including children and and women and and, and that sort of thing and slaves and all that stuff. But uh, this is a large group of people that are just coming out and saying, you know, you take too much upon yourselves. And we're going to look at that phrase a little bit more. But they're coming against Moses. They're coming against Aaron. Coming against the leadership because they are unhappy with the situation. They don't want to remain, you know, live out the remainder of their lives drifting around in that wilderness. And so this is an out and out rebellion against God. God has told them, this is your fate. This is what's going to happen. And they are not willing to uh, settle for that. And so uh, tonight I wanted to begin. It's, we're talking about a mutiny, so I can't go without telling one of my Navy stories, of course. Um, there was a time that I was in a, a squadron for about four years. And, and I was getting to the place in my career where I was an E5 and, and fairly senior, getting pretty salty, thought I knew everything. And we were doing deployments on this ship, the USS Mount Whitney. And uh, there was a time over the course of about a year that every time that ship went out and it was going out regularly, I was assigned to be one of the leading guys on there and, and to lead people out. And so I had about four or five of these little deployments under my belt of going out on this ship. So I knew the routine very well and, and I knew the aircraft and I knew the mission and, and I had a pretty good handle on what we were doing. And as other people would come in, I would train them and get them trained up. And, and after a while, the more senior guys than me, the chiefs and the first class petty officers, they just said, man, Glenn's got it. Let him, let him run with it. You know, he's been doing this for over a year now and he's got it. And, and so I, I got very salty and I thought I had the world by the tail until at the end of that, cru- at the end of that um, tour in the Navy, another senior chief petty officer came along who didn't know me. And he didn't know anything about our aircraft. And he didn't know anything about our ship. And he didn't know anything about that mission. And he went to sea with us. And I was expecting to run the show again. And I was expecting to do all that stuff I had been doing. But he would have no- none of it. 
And he said, no way, I, I've got it, you know, I don't need your help. And, and he just wouldn't let me do what I had been trained to do. And, and I got very angry about that. And, and me and a couple of other guys, uh, we didn't like this senior chief at all because he didn't allow us to do it the way we had been doing it. He was changing the, the plan on us. And so we began to grumble and complain and, and plan a little rebellion against him. And uh, we thought, you know what we could do is we could just sit down. Nobody likes this guy in the whole detachment. Let's all write our names out saying, you know, we don't like the way he's running things. And we'll just take that and give it to the commanding officer and tell him how unsatisfied we are with this guy. And there needs to be a change. And so we, we began doing that. And we had a whole list of names of people that just couldn't stand this senior chief. And we finally went to the first class petty officer. And uh, we told him what's going on, and he didn't like him either. And we gave him this list of names, and we said, look, you know, nobody likes this guy. We need, to, we need to do something about this. Let's go to the commanding officer, and maybe he can talk to him and tell him to chill out. And uh, he took one look at our list, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, you know, in a court-martial, this could be considered mutiny. This list of, of grievances against this guy, and your name's all on this. This is mutiny. This is considered mutiny. Uh, and, and so we found ourselves uh, ha- developing a mutiny as we were getting all the people together to, to come against this guy. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to look at tonight, you know, it, it's not the person who has all of the answers. Korah, you remember... The sons of Kohath, what was their responsibility? As we opened up the book of Numbers, we started learning who, who had what tasks. And the sons of Korah were children of Levi, but they were not uh, children of Aaron, which means they were not in the priesthood. They were guys who worked around the tabernacle and around the priesthood, but they were the movers. Remember, when the, when the tabernacle would break down and they would leave, the Levites would get all that stuff packaged up, the Ark of the Covenant and, the, and the, um, everything else in there, cover it all up so that it couldn't be seen or touched by anyone. And then the Kohathites would come along as the, the moving crew and they would take all that stuff and load it onto their carts and they would move it. That was their responsibility. That was their God-given task that, that God wanted them to do. And it was very clear that they were not to touch any of the, the priesthood articles that they were not to go in there when it was uncovered or any of that sort of thing. But now we find this guy, Korah, saying, you know, I've been around this stuff. It's not that big of a deal. I I think that I can be involved in it a little bit deeper. Who are you, Moses? Who are you, Aaron, to be the only ones? I mean, we're all holy. Uh, You know, we can all do this. We've all seen the implements there, and, and we understand. Why can't we all be involved in it? What makes you so special? Moses and Aaron. But, you know, it's not the person who knows. It's not the person who has the experience. It's what God says. It's all about what God says. And God said that these are the tasks that these people do and these are the tasks that Moses and Aaron do and and it's God's word and therefore we should not rebel against it. But, of course, their plan is to not spend the rest of that 40 years out there in in the desert. And it reminds me of Saul. Um, You remember that that Samuel had told Saul that the Lord wants you to go and wipe out the Amalekites. The Lord wants you to go and, and wipe them all out. The word of the Lord coming down to you right now is to go and wipe them all out. Don't leave anybody alive. Don't leave any oxen alive Women, children, the whole thing, they're to be completely destroyed, utterly destroyed is what the Lord's word was to them. But you remember that he came back and he had the the choice lambs and the choice oxen, the really nice stuff. And he came back and, and Samuel said, what are you doing? Why didn't you keep what the word of the Lord had said to you? Why have you transgressed against the Lord? And he goes, well, I haven't. I've done exactly what the Lord wanted me to do. And Samuel said, well, why do I hear those sheep bleeding in my ears? Why do I hear those oxen lowing in my ears? Why haven't you done what God has told you to do? 
And so Samuel, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, tells him, has the, Lord, uh, has the Lord as great delight... Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, what Saul had said was, well, I'm going to, we're going to keep those choice lambs and those choice oxen and offer them to the Lord. That's what we're going to do. That's why we've kept the choice stuff, and that's why we didn't kill them. We're going to offer them up to the Lord, and that'll be pleasing in his sight, surely. And then Samuel comes back. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. The job of the, Isra- of the Levites was to carry out the priesthood, was to carry out those offerings. But you know, there wouldn't be a need for the Levitical priesthood, if man was obedient to what God had originally asked them to do. And so the argument here from Korah is, hey, we can all be doing this stuff. We, we don't have to have it set up the exact way that God has said here. We're rebelling against that. Aren't we all holy? Every one of them. The Lord is among all of us. Why can't we do this? We can offer these sacrifices. We can be involved in the priesthood. But it's not what the Lord has said. And it's very clear here that the Lord desires obedience to his word more than sacrifice. And so they're beginning on the wrong foot here. And so he goes on, Samuel does, and he says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You think that rebellion is, is, is not a very serious matter. I remember, you know, just walking through the mall here as I'm working. And uh, often I'll see down at Playland over here a mother or a father with their child. And, and often the children are very disobedient, you know. And, and I've even heard children yell back at their parents or even cuss back at their parents and and uh, and some of the parents laugh about it. Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> isn't that cute? He's rebelling against me. Or she's rebelling against me. And I of- often think as I walk by that uh, it's not going to be so cute when they're 16. It's not going to be so cute when they're 14 or 15. When they're rebelling and cussing at you and telling you no and, and all that sort of thing. You know, rebellion is a very serious matter in the eyes of the Lord. The rebellion is, it's as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is the, as is iniquity and idolatry. It's very serious in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord would rather have you be obedient than to offer the sacrifices that you have to offer for not being obedient. And so Samuel goes on to tell Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. And so this situation here with Korah, rebelling, it's a very serious matter in the eyes of the Lord, and it's not just one or two. Remember in the past we've looked at a couple of people are groaning and mumbling and murmuring against the Lord or against Moses. We now have a a very large group of people who are are, uh, trying to overthrow, really. It's a coup really, is what we're looking at here. They're trying to overthrow the rule of Moses. And it's interesting what they say here, um, before we get to that. Reuben, interesting the names here. Reuben, the sons of Reuben are involved. In the, you know, they're not real happy about the fact that the firstborn lineage isn't running the show like you would normally have. But um, you remember that the blessing that went out to Reuben Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. You're my firstborn. This is the blessing to the son, Reuben. But what else does he say? You're unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. And you remember that story as he he went into his father's bed with his uh, stepmother and all that sort of thing. And um, he's, he's a rebel. You're unstable as water. You're not going to excel. Reuben's involved. They're the sons of Reuben are involved in this as well. Um, the sons of Korah, it's interesting, that uh, Korah 
if you go to the Psalms, you see some of the Psalms are written by the sons of Korah. And so evidently they learned their lesson because what they write in some of the Psalms is, is very telling that they learned the lesson of, of their rebel against the Lord and that they found their place and that they were happy with the place that God had ordained for them, for their lives and for their ministries. And in Psalm 84, 1, it says at the top of that Psalm, it's a Psalm of the sons of Korah. And it goes on, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there are a par- couple parts here. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Man, I just want to be there. I want to be in the courts of the Lord. No matter what I'm doing, my soul longs for the courts of the Lord. And it goes on a little bit later in that passage in verse 10. uh, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'm satisfied with any position that God is going to give me. Uh, you know, just a picture of we don't want to rebel against God and, and we don't want to have this, this rebellion against God anymore. We're satisfied with just being a doorkeeper. Uh, just any way at all that I can serve you, Lord, I am satisfied with that. And... Uh, you know, we sing that song, better is one day than a thousand elsewhere. What better is one day in the house of the Lord in any position, no matter if you're up here on stage or you're over in the children's ministry or you're back in the back greeting or, or just sitting in the pew. It's better to be with the Lord one day than a thousand uh, days elsewhere or dwelling in the tents of wickedness. And of course, I, I believe that we can see that the sons of Korah learned that lesson well. And so, looking again here, we want to look at what they say to Moses and Aaron. They say in verse 3 there, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy. You're taking too much upon yourselves. And other ways you can see the translations here, um, it's not necessarily saying you've got too much going on. Uh, You're overloaded. Hey, let us help you with that burden. It's more along the lines of, hey, haven't you done enough? Haven't you taken enough to yourself? Haven't you, you know, uh, let the past suffice you? Look at all the stuff you've done in the past. You've you've done enough. You've had your day as, as the leader. Why don't you, you know, let somebody else give it a try for a while? Why don't you let somebody else get in there and give it a shot? Because, You've, you've failed miserably is kind of what they're saying to Moses and Aaron. Uh, haven't you done enough? Haven't you taken enough to yourself? Uh, why don't you let somebody else try for a little while? And that's, that's kind of the implication there. Um, and then there, again, their implication is all of the congregation is holy. Anybody can do what you're doing, Moses. Uh, we're not ready to go to that. But continuing on there in verse um, 4, So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And of course, that's a a great uh, spiritual leader right there. (laughs) Fall on your face, seek the Lord, get into his word. Man, just pray, seek the Lord's face, seek his wisdom on this whole thing. Humble yourself. Uh, Of course, it's it's a grieving. Oh man, I can't believe they're rebelling again. And so he falls on his face and uh, he, he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning... The Lord will show you, and I think the implication here is that, the, that Moses may have fallen on his face and then the Lord told him what he's about to tell Korah. You could possibly uh, fit that in there. We don't want to read into it, but Moses comes back to Korah and says to him, tomorrow morning the Lord will show you, show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses will cause to come near him. Do this, take censers, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. And that's a pretty powerful statement there from Moses. I'm not taking too much. You're biting off way more than you can chew. You don't know what you're asking for here. You want to be a priest? Okay, go make some censers, put some incense in there, and then tomorrow we'll find out 
who God has made the priests. We'll find out who God chooses to be his priest. And uh, you've taken on way, way more than you're, than you're wanting to take on. I guarantee you that. And so, um, verse 8, Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing that you, to you that God... I'm sorry, is a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve them and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all of your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Is it a small thing? To you? Is it no big deal to you? Is it just, you know, you've got a crummy job? Is that what you think? That it's a small thing that God has given you the privilege and the honor to serve Him in this way? You get to carry the, the table of showbread. You get to carry the Ark of the Covenant. You, you get to do all these things. You are right there in the tabernacle of the Lord. Is that nothing to you? Does that not mean a thing to you? is what Moses is saying here. And now, is that not enough? You want to take on the priesthood also? Moses is shocked that they are are just looking at their jobs in such a low regard. And so, he says to him in verse 11, Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Your beef's not with me. Your beef's not with Aaron. You're gathered together against the Lord, and you need to know that. You're gathered together against Him, against His Word, against what He has clearly laid out to us over the course of the last two years. Your beast's not with me. You're fighting against God, and and you're going to find out how that's going to go for you tomorrow. And so, I thought it was interesting here. He said, He has brought you near to Himself. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? It goes along with the, the psalm the sons of Korah wrote later on. You know, I'll be a doorkeeper. As long as I can be near the Lord, as long as, long as I can be serving Him in some way and, and being around His people and, and just being involved in the work of the ministry, it's enough. It's enough for me. I won't take on any more. And so in verse 12, Moses sent to call Dathan an Abri- Abiram. How about that? The sons of Eliab. And they said, we will not come up. And so now we have just an out and out no. Just disobedience to to Moses. We're not going to do anything you tell us to do. We are completely in rebellion here. They say back to Moses, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us out out of a land flowing with milk and honey? How about that for a reversal? You took us out of a land flowing with milk and honey back there in Egypt. Man, we were were digging it back there. And you took us out of that great place that we were living. You don't remember the the beatings and the slavery and all that? You don't, don't remember that? Land flowing with milk and honey? Really? Come on. I mean, what a reversal. You took us out of that land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, More, oh, oh, and then it says... um, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Man, you brought us out here to die. You took us out of that great place we were living. You brought us out here to die and now you still want to act like a prince over us. So now we see the real issue here. We don't want you to be in charge of us any longer, Moses. We don't want you to act like a prince over us anymore. We're tired of your leadership and uh, we're, we want to head back to Egypt. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And so the idea here, will you put out the eyes of these men? It could be that he's saying, Maybe they think that Moses is going to trick them when they come up. Hey, come on up here. I want to talk to you guys. And then you come up there and he's going to gouge your eyes out. But um, a couple of the commentary guys I was looking at, they were talking about it might be better translated that 
will you pull the wool over their eyes in, in a sense? Are you going to have them come up there and then smooth things over with them and, and do your fancy talking again, pull the wool over their eyes so that they'll get back in line is kind of the idea. Are you going to try to pull the wool over their eyes so they won't be rebelling against you anymore? No, we're not coming up. You know, you've blown it, Moses. You haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. You haven't given us this inheritance of fields and vineyards that you promised us. Of course, they've forgotten that they had that opportunity to go, but they rejected it from the Lord. They, they, uh, they completely, it's their fault, not Moses' fault, that they're not in that inheritance. Verse 15, then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they, as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 censers. So he wants all of these leaders, all the 250 leaders out there with a censer uh, and incense in it, ready to go. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So Korah is quite a little rabble rouser. I mean, he's got the whole congregation out there now, and he's really trying to get people on his side. And, and uh, you know, guys like Korah, they never rebel on their own. They always have to have people backing them and, and trying to get as many people involved in the rebellion as possible, as many people. And, of course, you know, we can easily see a, a parallel with a church split kind of situation. And, and I know we've talked about that before, and I, I didn't want to go too deep into that. But, I mean, obviously the, the, um, the parallel is there, a congregation of people not happy with the leadership. Hey, let me get a couple of people of renown, a couple important people in the fellowship here, and we'll go make our statement and, and try to, you know, win over on the leadership or, or try to take over on the leadership. And that happens. And so we need to be very careful about that stuff. Uh, but he gathers the whole congregation against them at the door, the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation. And so here again we see Moses and Aaron interceding for the people. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, one guy has, has deceived them. One guy has gone out and filled their heads with rebellion and, and talked them into this. Will you, will you kill all the people just because of the sin of one man? It's kind of what they're saying there. And they're pleading to the Lord, but you can see here that God is siding with Moses and Aaron because he has chosen them. And, uh, and so, again, we see that intercession in front of God's wrath. And, you know, we've, we're, we've talked about this a couple times already, and we're going to talk about it a few more times, and it's interesting that we can look at it in different ways. Uh, one of the guys came up to me, I think after last week or the week before, and, you know, my view of this is that, that God is trying to get Moses to understand that he wants him to intercede for the people. And, uh, and, and that is exactly what God wants him to know, that he, he wants him to be there to stand up for the people, to intercede and to beg God for mercy on their behalf so that God won't kill them. But, you know, the question becomes, well, how can we look at this and not see it as God is just tricking Moses into doing this? How can we look at it and say, well, God's not being deceptive. God's not trying to deliberately be deceptive to them. And, and it's, a, it's a very valid question, you know. Why would God try to trick Moses into it? Why didn't he just tell him, hey, every time I do this, I want you to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the, the truths that we can take away from this is that God's wrath is very, very, very real. You know, he will destroy those who do not bend their knee and who do not have their sins atoned for, covered, washed away. He, his wrath is real. 
And there's no doubt about that. And so when he comes out and says, I'm going to destroy them, I don't think he's joking. I don't think he's joking around one little bit. I don't think he's just trying to be deceptive. I don't think he's trying to trick um, Moses into understanding, oh, oh, yeah, I need to intercede for him. No, don't, don't do it, God. Um, I don't think he is. I, I think that there's God's wrath and there's God's mercy and grace poured out when an intercessor is there, when somebody cries out for mercy, when somebody cries out for forgiveness, when somebody cries out and, and repents of their sins, God's wrath is, is, is assuaged, is, um, is taken care of. I don't know how that all works. I don't know what's going on in the mind of God when that kind of thing happens. Um, I don't think that we can find in the scripture a, a true answer here. But we know that God's wrath is real. It's not a joke. It's not an idle threat. It's not an idle threat that God won't destroy uh, the wicked. Back here in the, in the end or in the beginning of the Bible and in our future, it's not an idle threat when we turn back to the pages of Revelation and see God's wrath being poured out on the, on the inhabitants of the earth during the tribulation time. That's not an idle threat. That is... God's wrath falling on a, 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 a people who are rebellious against him. But God's grace and his mercy is equally as real. And so that is the best attempt that I can come up with to try to answer that question. Um, I, I thought about it in other ways, but you know, and, and we're going to look at it a couple of different times, like I said. So I, I think it's interesting to just be able to look at it but that's something to be thinking about. You know, it, it, God is not just trying to trick Moses. His wrath is real. His anger is real against them. And so, in verse 23, So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abir- <laughs> Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of the Israel followed him. It's interesting, now the elders are getting back in line. Oh yeah, let's, let's follow Moses again. We don't want to be associated with the rest of those guys. And it could, have, it could be other elders that were not involved in the, in the thing, but we don't know for sure. Uh, verse 26, and he spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, their little children. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. You know, I was just wandering around out there in the wilderness one day, and this bush caught on fire. Uh, I didn't set out to do this on my own. I am just trying to follow through with what God's will is. Um, he has directed me to do these things. And, uh, you know, He has chosen me. And I'm just trying to remain faithful to that. And so, what I'm going to say now is, by this you shall know. What is going to happen next will prove to you that God chose me to do this and it's of His will. And so he goes on there in verse 29. He says, If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. If all these guys that are rebelling here today, if you you see this group of people here with their 250 censors out here rebelling, if they live to be old men and just die of natural causes, then I'm not the guy. I'm not... I'm not the chosen one. I'm not the one that God sent. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. (laughs) That'd be a pretty good sign, wouldn't it? (laughs) Okay. If the earth opens up and they fall in and they're screaming as they're going down and then the earth closes back up and they die, you'll know that the Lord sent me. How's that? 
It's not like he's saying, okay, you know, if it starts raining in the next four hours, then you'll know. I mean, he's really throwing out that. And and you have to think that the Lord kind of revealed this to him, that the Lord told him possibly, hey, tell him this. And or, you know, he's he's maybe just stepping out in faith there and saying this is going to happen. And so um, it's a pretty bold uh, thing to say here. Verse 31, now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart unto them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. And so they and all those with them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed over them and they perished from among the the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> they ran. <laughs> let's get away from this sinkhole. Uh, let's get away from these people who were rebelling against God. Let's, they ran. They fled at their cry. For they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And the fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So the Lord takes them out. He takes out the families that were rebelling and who had started the rebellion. Those were the ones who went into the hole. And then the 250 elders, leaders, men of renown who were kind of coming on board with that rebellion, who were standing there uh, possibly uh, pretenders to the throne, pretenders to becoming the high priest possibly. These are our candidates. These men of renown here are our candidates to be uh, the high priest or to be in the Levitical priesthood. They're not Levites, but these are good guys. Let's put them up there and see what happens. Those are the guys. They were consumed with fire. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. I think I... I did skip um, a couple of verses here that I wanted to bring out. And... This is just that that cry for mercy that I was talking about. You know, talking about God's wrath. You know, it is very real. But His mercy and grace, you know, when we cry out to Him, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. A cry of mercy. God cannot resist that cry of mercy, that desire. You know, yes, I've sinned. And of course, this psalm is, is David's sin with Bathsheba. Psalm 51. I mean, you think your sins are grievous. And, and that God can't forgive my sins. Man, surely he's going to judge me. Surely my sins can't be forgiven. Then you go back and read what David did. The king of the nation steals this married woman, you know, goes to bed with her, gets her pregnant, uh, wants to cover it up, kills her husband, and then takes her to be his wife. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. And you think, how can God forgive that kind of thing? How can God forgive that and still call that man a man after God's own heart and, and still you know, lift him up as, a, as an example of what the kind of people that we should be, the kind of men that he wants to see? And it's because David had a heart for God. David had, he knew that, that the importance was being able to humble yourself and just come back and ask the Lord to re, uh, forgive your sins. And so he says in Psalm 51, 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. They're many. He goes on in that Psalm, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. That's the kind of heart that God wants. That's all it takes to take away that wrath. And we're looking at some, some wrath here that, you know, this is the kind of stuff that people look at the Old Testament and go, that's not the same kind of God I know in the New Testament. Man, he, you know, Jesus is so much less harsh than that. Well, the Old Testament is a picture of, of God's wrath for sure. And there is a lot of wrath there, but it's a picture of man needing an intercessor. It's a picture of God 
supplying one. It's a picture of, uh, of a future time where there'll be a Messiah that will take away that wrath, that will wash away those sins, that will atone for all those sins. And so I think that's a, a good way of looking at that. All right, so the censers there that they were using were turned into covers that were put over the altar as a sign. It says, they shall be a sign to the children of Israel, a sign of that rebellion. They were brass or, or uh, bronze uh, covers to, to lay over that altar. And so in verse 39, so Eliezer, the priest, took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they hammered out, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who was not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense. This is a sign. Only those who God has designated as Levites should be up here doing this work. 41, and on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel got on their knees and asked God for forgiveness and said, we'll never do that again. We'll never complain against you again, God. We'll never rebel ever, ever, ever again. (laughs) Nope. All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the Lord appeared. They're mad at at Moses and Aaron, but then they turn towards God's tabernacle. And the idea there in the original language is that they were thinking about doing something to the tabernacle. You know, how a a riot gets going and and people are, you know, I'm just so mad, I want to smash a window. You know, I mean, it was something like that. It was like the crowd mentality the angry crowd mentality oh, i just want and so they turn back and they look at the tabernacle of god possibly with the intent of wanting to destroy it or do something to it uh, remember they they've called into question the priesthood and so they're very angry about this and and so they turn toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly that cloud the shekinah glory of the lord covers it and the glory of the lord appeared and i think when I was reading that, that reminded me of the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, the rebellion of man. God is pouring out his wrath on the earth. He's pouring out the trumpet judgments and the bulls and, and all that stuff and the, the boils on people's faces and, and, and men are hiding under rocks to escape from all the things that are happening on the earth and, and all the things that they're seeing, the, the asteroids and the, the falling stars and everything that's happening. The, t- the blood red moon and the water turning to blood and all that stuff. Man, isn't that enough to bring you to repentance? You would think it would be. But as we see in the book of Revelation, they repented not. They still were shaking their fist at God. And there, there are verses that talk about as the Lord is descending, as, as they're looking up at him, they're fighting against him and wanting to sh- maybe shoot their weapons up at, at the Lord as he's coming back in the clouds. And that just gives you a picture of the rebellion of man and the rebellion of man's heart. Some men will never come to, uh, to the place where they'll bend the knee to the Lord. And, uh, and it's because of that that God's wrath has to come. And because uh, of that, God's wrath is severe. And I, I just saw that as really a picture of the Lord, you know, a, a little picture, a little glimpse maybe, as, as God, as Jesus is returning in the clouds you know, turning at him and, yeah, we don't want you. We're uh, worshiping this Antichrist over here and we're happy with him. And so uh, 43 and, and the rest of it, we'll just go ahead and wrap up here. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Once again, they fell on their faces so Moses, and Aaron, Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Then Aaron took it 
as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun, begun among the people. So he had put in the, the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those uh, who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. So once again, Moses and Aaron fall on their faces and they realize we've got to do something here. We've got to make atonement. We've got to cover that sin. They've learned this very well and it's now an automatic reaction for them. We've got to, we've got to make atonement for the people. We've got to cover their sins because this plague and all of us have this plague. This plague is, is continuing on through, uh, through time. And it will continue on till the very end of time. And that plague is rebellion against God. That plague is um, unfaithfulness. Unwilling to humble yourself and repent of your sins. And God's word clearly shows us that there's a wrath that falls on that rebellion. There's a wrath that falls because of that plague, because of the fallen nature of man. And uh, we need atonement for that. We need atonement. Not a partial covering that just covers up the sin, but a, a total cleansing where that sin is washed away completely. And that is done through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we can see that picture of Jesus here. He is that intercessor. He is that one that makes atonement for our sins, for our rebellion, for our, our hand shaking a fist at God. He covers our sins. He takes them away. So that's, uh, that's all for tonight, I believe. Uh, one last verse here, I guess, Isaiah 66, looking at that picture of, of, of Jesus coming back in the clouds, coming back uh, with wrath. The Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. And that's a very sad, sad fact. There will be many who refuse to bow. There will be many that will die. There will, there will be many that suffer that wrath but they don't have to they don't have to and again you know what is our responsibility we need to tell people we need to tell people about jesus we need to tell them to repent we need to share the good news of the gospel that they don't have to endure that wrath that it's a very simple thing to call out cry out for mercy to the lord because he wants to give it he desires that nobody goes through this he desires that nobody uh, perishes, but that all come to repentance. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, to remind us of your wrath that is a very serious thing. Lord, but most of all, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness and your nature to want to forgive us, to want to wash away and atone for and uh, deliver us from that fate. Father, we pray that here in this community we could be a light, Lord. We could be um, just a lighthouse of, of letting people know about your truth and about your grace and about your good news of your son dying in, in their